I am a linguist, which means I'm lucky enough to make a living studying one of the most unique and fascinating features of our species, language. Now, usually when I tell people I'm a linguist, they ask, how many languages do you speak? Or can you help me learn Spanish faster? Or are you the grammar police? And although I can't lie, I enjoy a grammar mistake more than most people, uh, what linguists like me spend a lot of time thinking about are really big questions, like why is it that humans have language when even our closest animal ancestors don't? So animals house systems of communication, but they're really rudimentary compared to our complex linguistic system, which allows us to infinitely combine and create and express our innermost thoughts to others. And if language is this special thing we share, why are our languages so different from one another? Are they really so different? Or are there sort of universal properties that all languages share? Now, these questions have always fascinated me. When I was at school, I took as many languages as I could. So I studied French, Spanish, German, Chinese, and with a reckless disregard for my future career prospects, as soon as I got to university, I studied exclusively dead languages. So Latin, ancient Greek, old Babylonian, Sanskrit, man, I thought they were so cool. And while my parents were wondering why they were shelling out so much money, I was wondering, hmm, are they really so different as they seem? Now, it took me some time, but eventually I found a community of like-minded people using science to understand how language works. Not just one language or a handful of languages, but language in general, language as this unique capacity we share. And after getting a PhD and working with some of the greatest minds in the field, I want to give you my take on what makes the questions linguistics is trying to answer uh, important to a broader audience. Language is a huge part of our daily lives. The particular language we speak allows us to communicate our thoughts, beliefs, desires, however mundane, to the people around us. Language allows us to mark ourselves as part of our community, and of course it allows us to spread ideas beyond that community. But when we encounter people who speak languages that we don't speak, the sounds coming out of their mouths seem strange and alien. Sometimes we can't tell where one word ends and the next one begins. And I'm sure you've had this experience, perhaps uh, listening to an airline steward read out the safety requirements of this Boeing 747. You've heard it a hundred times in your own language, right? But you can't make heads or tails of it in Chinese or Arabic. And in some cases, it's hard to imagine what their language could possibly have in common with ours, and in a way, that divides us from them. It marks us as different. But it sort of makes us, and you know, this is true even of linguists, it makes us ready to believe that the different languages we speak actually mean that we think differently from one another. So witness, for example, the amazing popularity of the claim that the Inuit languages have tons of words for snow. So snow when it's frozen, snow when it's slushy, snow when it's on the ground, snow when it's in a drift. If they have so many more words for snow than we do, then the way they perceive it, think about it, understand it, must be really different from the way we do. And maybe that means that the way they conceive of the world is fundamentally different from the way we do. But as my colleague at the University of Edinburgh, Jeff Pullum, wrote about in his work, The Great Eskimo Vocabulary Hoax, this turns out to be a legend. They don't have that many more words for snow than we do, and uh, especially not more words for snow than Scottish people do, it turns out. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, even if they did, this wouldn't actually tell us much about our respective capacity for thinking about snow in all of its glorious forms. But it's a seductive idea because it plays into our sense that the differences in language reflect deeper differences between us. So, can we study the world's languages which exhibit amazing diversity from sounds to syntax and see, instead of the differences, a reflection back of our unique human minds? In other words, can we find amidst that diversity underlying commonalities that can teach us something about the way we think.
Now, the answer I'm going to try to argue is yes, and this is supported by the research I've been doing for a number of years. Languages do show underlying commonalities, and even in cases where they look really different from one another, if we dig a bit deeper, we can see that they're cut from the same cloth. So to do this, I'm going to give you an example, and um, we need to first do a little bit of linguistics. So get ready, I'll just explain to you really quickly how cross-serial dependencies in some dialects of German have led some people to argue that language is on the mildly context-sensitive region of the Chomsky hierarchy. Just kidding. <laughs> Luckily, we can actually see these kinds of symmetries if we look at really everyday kinds of phrases, things we might use any time. So imagine that we're in a store together, and I'm trying to describe to you what I want to buy. And I point at one of the shelves, and I say, oh, I want those two blue vases. Now, obviously, you can understand the phrase, those two blue vases, immediately. But I want to dig just a little bit deeper and try to get at how we take those individual words and build a meaningful concept from them. And to do that, we need to work our way from the inside out. So the heart is the object I want to buy, vases. Those vases themselves have a particular property. They're blue. We can take that set of blue vases and count them. In this case, there are two of them. And that set of vases has some relation to the outside world. It has a relation to me. It has a relation to other objects in the store. In this case, it's something like a location. So it's those over there I want and not these here. Now, if we think about the meaning of these kinds of phrases in this way, from the inside out, all the words tell us something about the vases. But blue has the closest connection. It tells us some inherent property of the vases themselves. But these has a more distant connection. It tells us something about how the vases relate to other stuff out there in the world. This doesn't change no matter what language you speak. Words like blue, which express properties, they always describe these kind of close relationships with the objects they describe. And words like those always have a more distant relation. But crucially, languages do differ in the way they order the words in these phrases. So for example, in English, we have those two blue vases. But in Spanish, we have the equivalent of those two vases blue. In Arabic, something like two vases blue those. In Tahitian, those vases blue too. In Yoruba, spoken in West Africa, you get vases blue too those. Phew. And that's not even all the possibilities. In fact, there are four factorial, or 24, different possible ways that languages could order the words in these phrases. So maybe anything goes. Maybe languages like French and Spanish, they share a common ancestor, so they look like one another. But maybe we can't really understand anything about the way language works in general from these kinds of phrases. But amazingly, if we come back to this picture with blue closest to vases and those farthest away, we can see that those languages which looked so different from one another, are all built from this very same scaffold. In fact, we can simply read them off it. So here you have English, Spanish, languages like Lai, like Wolof, Sango, Arabic, Tahitian, Yoruba. That's eight language types, and it turns out all possible ways of reading a linear sequence of words off of that non-linear conceptual structure that I was telling you about. What's even cooler is that people use this same scaffold when they're using their hands to communicate instead of the languages that they speak. With some colleagues at the University of Edinburgh, we ran a study where we asked native English speakers who had no knowledge of any sign language um, to use just their hands to communicate about what was in front of them. So we sat them down at a table, and we had two iPads in front of them. iPads, no. iPads. <laughs> so one iPad was closer to them, and one was a bit farther away, just like the vases I showed you before. And pictures would come up on those iPads. So they might see five, uh, four striped triangles or five spotted squares. 
and they had to use only their hands to communicate uh, what they saw. And we didn't show them how to do it, we just asked them to do it spontaneously, and we recorded them. This was slightly embarrassing for people at first, but actually this comes pretty easily. And I'm gonna show you an example. What you'll see is a girl seated at a table. She'll have two iPads in front of her, and a picture is gonna come up on one of them, and you can see whether you can figure out what she's seeing. One more time. So you should have noticed that the picture is coming up on the iPad that's closest to her, and what she's seeing is five spotted squares. So the order that she uses in her gestures is not English, but it perfectly maps onto this scaffold. So first she provides the location, the iPad, then the number, then the object, and then the property. And incredibly, this is what we saw for all the participants in our study. No matter what order they used in their gestures, they always reflected these relationships between the words, just like the different languages that I told you about before. So sometimes they would put the number or their location after the noun, but whenever they did that, the property was always closest, then the number, and then the location. So what does this tell us? Well, what it suggests is that how our human minds work, that is, how we conceptualize the relationships between elements in these simple phrases, is reflected in how we communicate spontaneously and in the conventionalized language systems that we use. The languages I showed you before looked, on the surface, quite different from one another, but deep down, they all bear this same signature. So, this is just one example, but it shows that language is shaped by human cognition. In other words, the way we think determines in some way the way our systems of communication look. And we can find this kind of hidden symmetry in many phenomena in language. And in each case, we're given a little peek into the black box that is the human mind. So the, mes the message to take home is this. We should celebrate our differences, including the way our languages look and sound. Indeed, as scientists, we need this kind of diversity in order to understand the full range of possibilities that our linguistic capacity can generate. But we should also consider that underneath those differences, for example, in the way we order words in very simple phrases, underneath those differences, we can find commonalities. And those commonalities make language a really powerful reflection of all we have in common. Thank you.